for our next presentation, I am super excited to bring to the, uh, the stage, the virtual stage, Will Simarosa, who is our head of market research. Will is going to join us uh, in just a minute. And, and since today marks the official launch of our qualitative research platform, Suzy Live, we thought it would be appropriate to have Will share some thoughts on how qual and quant research go hand in hand to unlock truly powerful insights. Uh, we'll use some of these methodologies at GSK uh, to drive unprecedented growth and, uh, and he's here to, to show you how to do it. Um, but before Will joins us, I did wanna share just a little bit more about Suzy Live and um, give you a quick sneak peek. Where there was once understanding, there's now distance. And everything we thought about consumers has been turned on its head. 2020 brought seismic shifts in consumer behavior and an inability to conduct in-person qualitative research, leaving brands with expensive and inefficient solutions to speak directly with the consumers they care about most. Unprecedented times call for unprecedented innovation. Introducing Suzy Live. Suzy Live combines the speed, targeting, results, and quality you've come to trust from Suzy. Just tell us who you'd like to reach, when you're available, and we'll handle the rest. The process has never been so simple. Suzy Live brings together the audience, scheduling, moderation, transcription, and all the features you need in a simple and easy qualitative research platform. Talk directly to your consumers through powerful, face-to-face, high-quality, in-depth online interviews. With just a few clicks, you get direct access to our screened and verified audience so you can gain a deeper understanding of the consumers that matter to you letting you test new concepts, prep for a product launch, assess your advertising strategy, and validate all your assumptions. Let's build something extraordinary together. Put the voice of the consumer at your fingertips with Suzy Live. So without further ado, um, I'm gonna welcome Will to the stage. Uh, if anybody is interested in learning more about Suzy or Suzy Live, definitely check out uh, our website at suzy.com and request a demo. Uh, back to the agenda. Uh, prior to joining Suzy, I want to give Will a quick introduction here. Will worked client side, uh, leading global insights for major CPG and pharma companies, uh, including GSK. Will was actually a client of Suzy's uh, at GSK. He loved the platform so much that he joined us full time and is now leading our market research center of excellence. Uh, and he also makes sure that our product is really driven by the needs of customers since he was a power user of Suzy uh, in his past life. So everyone sit tight. Your browser is going to refresh in a second. Uh, and the next session uh, featuring Will Samarosa talking about bridging quant and qual will start any moment. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Will. I'm here to talk to you today about bridging quant and qual methodologies. We've got about 30 minutes together. Um, this is a topic that probably could be covered under a full semester's class, right? So in 30 minutes, what are we going to talk about today at a high level? Um, my agenda is to get you 25 minutes of content with uh, some time at the back end for discussion. I'm gonna introduce a little bit about myself and who am I to be talking about any of this. I'm gonna provide some context about why you should care about bridging those methodologies. And we're gonna talk a little bit about latent variables um, and framing a challenge that I think quant qual mixed approaches can help us understand and talk a little bit about implementation before we dive into any types of comments or questions. So let's talk a little bit about who I am to be talking about any of this. Um, if we're going to be talking about research and rigor, which we will be at some point today. Um, I want to make sure that we talk a little bit about positionality as well. Right. And we're going to be talking about some tools that have, you know, started and, and, you know, started market research before I was, um, even around just a glimmer in my father's eye, you know, a lot of this um, tools that we're going to be talking about today started in the 70s. Um, and that's a little bit about where the background is for what we're going to be talking about. Um, where do I fit in with all of this? Well, I'm a researcher um, by training. Um, 2002 to 2007. Yes, that's five years. I spent a long time in graduate school where I immersed myself in qualitative and quantitative methodologies. Um, I lingered there. I enjoyed it. It's a passion of mine, which is one of the reasons I'm here today. From 2007 to about today, when it was time to get a real job um, and make a living, I've worked um, at both the vendor and the client side. Um, from 20, 2007 to 2012, I worked as a design researcher for a CPG design firm 
with a focus on consumer behavior. And the last eight years of my uh, career have been spent on the client side, um, uh, mostly global market research, where I had my hand in everything from innovation, foundational research, comms tracking, um, and performance metrics. Um, I've been on both sides of the screen. I've been on both the vendor and the client side. So I've experienced a lot of the things that I'm going to be talking about firsthand, and they're things that I'm particularly passionate about. Um, some of the challenges that I'm going to be talking about today, I would argue, are why I'm here today with the grayness in my beard, um, stressing and thinking about these things. Um, today, I'm a new uh, member of Susie. I've been here just about three months. And one of the things that excited me to, to come to this organization is to start to bring to life some of the research tools and solutions I always wished I had um, with the experience I've had in this industry. And with that, we're going to dive into some of the context of what I want to talk to you about today. And that is tools. Um, the whole purpose for this event is to launch Suzy Live, which I would argue is a new type of tool. It's a qualitative tool that allows you to target respondents who answered a specific survey in a certain way. I'm not here to sell you that tool. I'm here to challenge you to start looking at the tools that are in your toolkit because the world is rapidly changing around us. Um, and if you don't start to rethink about the tools that you have in your toolkit, it you risk being le uh, kept left behind. Um, and I, I want to talk a little bit about um, those tools now. Market research methodologies are tools just like any other tool, and they're designed to do specific jobs and tasks. The most efficient tools are almost always specialized. Um, with the right tool, you can do the job better, faster, more efficiently. It gives you a competitive advantage. Wrong tool for the wrong you know, job, you fall behind, right? And those, the best tools, like I said, are always specialized. The ability to specialize the tools in our toolkits are going to determine what gives us a competitive advantage. But with that framework, we also need to talk about what the job is. And sometimes we lose track of what that is. As market researchers, our job really is grounded in something that I'll call behavior change. You've probably heard that before. What are those behavior changes? Well, it's to get someone who's entering in the category to enter the brand through or enter the category through your brand. We're talking about household penetration. Another key behavior change that's going to determine the success of your brand is your ability to keep them. Someone has to now change their behavior to be loyal. You know, you need to defend brand share. <clears throat> and it's all about growing your brand as well. How can you change behavior to drive lifetime value? And how can you steal share from other brands? And how can you drive usage? How can you impact your total share and your rate of consumption? If this isn't something that you're able to actually do at the end of the day with the output of your research, we're not really doing our jobs. And this is the context I want to talk about now. We started off talking about positionality of some of the tools that, that first started off this industry in the 70s. Well, today we have an embarrassment of riches when it comes to tools that can help us do our job. Um, from the service providers who can handle it from beginning to end for you, to the tech solutions that can help you um, access and, and observe your respondents in new ways, and the panel solutions that can actually help you set up the basis for your, your work. There's no shortage of these, right? We've got a lot of tools that we can use to help us do those jobs, to help us get keep and grow our consumers um, much more effectively than we ever could have in the past. Now, as someone who's been on, on both sides of the vendor client relationship, I'm also intimately familiar with another reality. And that reality is unfortunately, we tend to choose, and that's the important part, to choose our tools based on skate, stage gates and you know, stage gate requirements and vendor relationships. Um, it's just the reality we live in, right? So. We're looking at things such as foundational research. Do we know who our consumers are? Do we know what the size of prize is? Do we know what the drivers are of their behavior mm -hmm. from an innovation pipeline? You know, do we know how to develop products that are going to delight and grow our brands? Eventually, we need to be able to develop campaigns that's going to create demand. Um, and ultimately, we need to track performance in the wild. Are our, our, our products and our campaigns performing as we expected? Right? And this usually involves a lot of steps where quant and qual methodologies now start to come in. You do some exploratory qual to understand who the consumers are in your category. You quantify it and you turn that into some sort of foundational learning. You're bringing your qual to identify what the needs are in the category and you measure them. And a lot of times those can become segmentations, personas. Um, and then once you have that, it's about making sure that your, your, your foundational understanding, your drivers are representing the products and, and that you're offering in the concepts that you're developing to delight your consumers. And when you get to that next stage gate, 
you need to often create some sort of forecast or manage some sort of risk. Is this really a product that's worth investing in? What are the tools that we use from a quant qual perspective to develop that, that positioning, or to develop that concept, and then to validate it? Same thing with campaigns. We use qual to explore, iterate, and evolve our campaigns, and eventually we quantify it. Often, in this case, it's with some sort of normative database as well, some sort of validation study. And then ultimately, we need to, to track the performance, where we will start to understand what it is that's driving performance. Um, and we have, you know, always on tracking these days. But I know the answer to this, but I'm going to ask it. It's rhetorical. Do we, when we come up with a segmentation, really know what's driving our consumers' behaviors? Remember, a segmentation of a category or of occasions is exi of existing users already, right? Like, what actually got them there? Are our forecasts actually grounded in what drives that category usage? Are we, you know, are we really seeing accurate outputs? Are normative creative benchmarks even relevant to what the job is to be done for your campaign? And at the end of the day, does your marketing mix model really look at causation and correlation? I know the answer is often no, right? But we live with stage gates, right? So what I'm going to talk to you today is about leveraging quant call methodologies, more targeted approaches to help us deal with some of the risk management that we have to do with stage gates. Because the reality is a lot of the tools that we're using today are woefully inadequate for managing the differences between observed and stated behavior. So let's get into that. Right. When you know that this isn't something that's working for you, um, you know, the definition of insanity is something you need to remind us about, right? So let's let's jump in and actually start to go through uh, uh, what I'm going to call a latent variable experience. All right. This is a, a, a an immersive exercise, um, and it's meant to be demonstrative, right? What am I talking about when I talk about latent variables? I'm going to take you through it and have you experience it. Um, so please, pens and pencils down, no cheating. Right? I'm, I'm just going to ask you to be patient while I create an experience for you. I'm going to read a word for you. All I need you to do is listen and absorb it. Vacation. Swimming. Heat. Bathing suit. Ice cream. Breeze. Refreshing. Splashing. Bubbles. Sand. Towel. Laughing. Picnic. Games. Water. And now I would like to you to write those words down if any of you actually have pencils. Okay. Um, think deep. It was just about 17 seconds. What were those words that you recall? Right. The point is I'm creating an experience that was designed and it's a, I'll be honest, it's a facetious example. But this is an experience that's going to help us understand what I'm talking about when it comes to latent variables and how quant qual can help us unpack those to be more effective at driving, get, keep, and go. So take the, last, the next two or three seconds, dig deep, and write down the last one or two words um, that you can remember. I believe there was 17 there. What you're seeing on the right are the words that I read to you, and what you're seeing on the left is an image of a pool. Some of you may or may not have um, written down the word pool, but we've played this game before on our side, and I'm going to actually call this a pool experience. All right. Why am I calling this a pool experience? It's because we've played this game. Uh, when we showed this to over 5,000 students, and we waited 45 minutes. So, so, so those of you that got more than four words, congratulations. But imagine doing this 45 minutes later. We don't have that kind of time today. 64% of them did recall the word pool. You can see 54% recalling the word beach and then a smaller percentage uh, for some of the other words. But 73% after 45 minutes couldn't recall more than, than four words. All right. But the reality is the fact that the word pool wasn't there doesn't matter. As you know, perception is reality, particularly when it comes to your consumers. And those words, these words are what are making up the experience, right? And experience matters. The latent variable are all the past experiences that shape the way the students experienced these words, as well as the demographic details that describe the students themselves, right? It's the stuff that's happening subconsciously. It's the stuff that's already happened in the past that's affected the way that you see things today and in the moment. And one of the challenges that we face as market researchers is figuring out how to deal with that. As we all know, what a consumer says and what a consumer does is often not the same thing. With a revisiting of how we use our qualitative and our quantitative tools, 
we can actually start to achieve some better understanding of what these latent variables are to inform the get key pro strategies. In this facetious example, we use qualitative exploration of the pool experience um, to generate a model. And that model came out at an 89% prediction accuracy of who was going to recall which word based on demographics and some of those qualitative details. Now this is a facetious parlor trick, right? But it uses some of the tools that are available to you today and that previous screen that I showed to you, right? And what we're seeing here now is 89%, I would challenge, is often close, if not better, than some of your forecasts or normative outputs, right? And this wasn't even a robust study. This is just a demonstration of what a latent variable is. Let's talk a little bit more about what the potential for quant qual methodologies are to get us to that, right? And I want to do that by challenging you to think, how would a consumer answer some of these questions? What specifically made you think of the word pool? What was the barrier that prevented you from recalling the words beach or camp? If you put that in a, in a questionnaire, um, in a discussion guide, you might get an answer, but we both know that there's no way a consumer can answer that. It's, it's that latent variable. It's the things that are impacting what actually happened. You can't answer that effectively. We can measure it and we can predict what's going to happen. And these are the types of things that we need to start to consider today if we're going to stay relevant as market researchers. Because I promise you, creating a pool experience is not fundamentally any different than creating a category entry experience, a brand share switching experience, or a loyalty experience. So what can we do for those tools to help inform the, the metrics that actually drive our, our brands, the behaviors that drive our brands? Let's revisit that timeline. Um, you know, this is a, a reminder of what was going on between 1976, 1977, right? The space shuttle hadn't flown on its own yet. Jimmy Carter was president. The Chrysler LeBaron um, made its debut. There's less than 80 channels on TV. And amongst those, the love boat was one of them. Um, it was a fundamentally different world where your ability to measure those latent variables didn't quite exist. We didn't have, nor did we have the data tools to do this, right? Things like that, the Van Westendorp price sensitivity meter actually asks the consumer when they think it's going to be expensive versus observing how they behave when given a price, right? A, a basis type normative database forecast was cutting edge for its day. It was absolutely the right thing to do at the time with the data that was available and what could be observed. Same thing with copy and creative split testing. But we're still using these fundamental tools that were grounded in a solution for a world that existed in the 70s, right? There's some rules that have always applied to market research that need to be revisited today. You never ask a respondent something that can be observed. And there's a lot of purchasing behavior that you can now access. Stated behavior and observed behavior are rarely the same. And just as a reminder, causation and correlation do matter, right? Accounting for what that, that latent variable, which is what the, the difference between what the consumer says they're gonna do and what they actually do, is not the same type of challenge as it was when these tools were developed. And remember, we're using these to mitigate risk, right? Everything that you see here on this right side of the screen was, was very accessible um, in the 70s. You can have your sales metrics, your share metrics, consumption, household penetration, and you always knew what your spend was going to be. And, and even back then, you could back into what your competitors were doing. And you could start to understand what was going on with Get, Keep, Grow, um, you know, correlations. And we've been using those tools successfully, and they've been very, very effective. But we live in a different world today where we now have access to incorporate the latent variables, the latent variables on how a consumer perceives a brand, how they perceive the product, what they need, how they, they're so psychographically, uh, you know, made up, what are their their emotional and functional needs, um, what are their barriers? These are our latent variables that with qualitative research, we can flush out into statements that it's easy for consumers to talk about. It's much easier for them to talk about the experiences they've actually had than to talk about the ones that you're asking them about what they're going to do. And what's, what's exciting about today, and I'm, I'm, what excites me about today, is that with the data science tools available to us, we can make these connections now. The challenge is we need qualitative research to come up with the attributes that a consumer can react to effectively, right? What I'm showing here is a, uh, an illustration of, of a neural net from a, from a machine learning algorithm. There's back propagation tools. I prefer structural equation models. The point is there's more than one way to go about this. There's an embarrassment of riches and tools that are cost effective and can start to bring the latent variables into the picture of real world outcomes that affect our business in ways that, that weren't possible before, right? This has been a, personal vendetta of mine trying to get forecasts and to get through stage gates that were actually tied to consumption. And like I'm saying, there are a lot of ways that we can do this. I've experienced it. And now let's talk a little bit about how to do this and bring it to life. 
What I want to do is, is remind everyone about observe observations. You never ask about something that you can observe. And what I'm challenging us to do is to start thinking about the assets and the day-to-day -day experiences that we that we create for our consumers, whether it's TV, whether it's a user review, whether it's it's a interaction in the store or word of mouth. These are the experiences that are, are latent variables that are going to affect outcomes. We need to learn and accept that and start to ask the questions that we can correlate and understand causation on what they're doing for outcomes. And we do that through observation. Instead of asking a consumer what we're going to do, I would like to challenge you guys to start thinking about intercepting them in the moments that matter. That means when someone is first entering the category, right? intercept them. You've just observed that they've made that purchase. When they're rebuying it and they're being loyal, intercept them. You've made an observation now that's going to change your ability to do these calculations that you don't have to ask about. If they're switching brands, there's a lot of ways that you can get that information. You know you have it, right? It's time to intercept them and ask them questions around qualitative latent variables, attributes that they can answer. What are those? Those would be, instead of asking you why you did it, how did you feel at the time? What are some of the physical and emotional states that, that you can come up with attribute statements that a consumer could agree or disagree to? What are the statements that describe the way they perceive the brand or the product, right, that they can react to? What are some of the touch points, you know, that, that make up these experiences and experiences that they've had that they can react to? And now you're, you're, you're playing with fire when you start to get to some of the more advanced data, data analytics, because now you can start to tell a story about what drives that behavior change. Qualitatively, you can come up with the attribute statements and quantitatively, you can find out which ones are driving that behavior. What does that mean? That means that when you go back to your foundational stage gates, you can still do your segmentation, but intercept those consumers and build an attribution model of what's driving behavior change. Turn that into a set of jobs to be done for your innovation team so that they can evaluate concepts, not just on stated intent, but around the attributes that are predictive of a behavior change. The same thing goes for your copy. And then when you actually put this in the wild, your tracker should be built around those attributes as well. So you can make sure that these products and these campaigns are performing as predicted. And then you develop a new type of feedback loop. I know all of you know how to use quant and qual together. But when you're actually able to use qual to develop a list of attributes that you can turn into a model and then observe people reacting to those attributes and ask them why, you're playing a different fundamental game. Dedicated focus on the attributes that matter and qualitative understanding of what it is about the experiences we create is going to allow us to create better outcomes. You're not going to have to worry about the, the, the norms and their predictability if you know what the experiences are that are predictive of a behavior change. So let's look at how we do this from a foundational standpoint. I'm not gonna go into the tech, technicalities of this, but typically when you do your qualitative research, you do an analysis, right? And you do um, you know, a quantitative measurement of it. I'm suggesting it's a model. When you're doing your, your content analysis for your qualitative, your early stage exploratory qual, it's about coming up with lists of statements. All the statements that a consumer could agree or disagree to on a scale that describe how they feel at the time of the intercept, of the moment that matters, how they perceive the brand and of the different touch points they interact with and the sources of influence. The output of that then becomes an input, right? Now you can intercept these consumers when they're exhibiting the get deep grow behaviors. And instead of asking them why, you actually have them quickly measure uh, with, with sliders what, how much you agree or disagree to this statement. And you can start to measure the causation for what gets someone to, to actually exhibit this behavior, behavior change. So what this means then, if you think about it, if you know a snapshot of what your media spend was, if you know what um, your share of voices and you know what your distribution, your, uh, your actual household penetration was at that moment, you can start to actually generate forecasts, inputs from the, before you ever test anything. And then you can turn that into jobs to be done for your early stage concepts and for your actual campaign assets and into tracking tools. You can hone that in when you can actually observe a respondent answering against an attribute. You can pull them in and ask them why, whether it's with us or somewhere else, someone's going to do it. And the tools and the ability to be predictive that they're going to be able to come up with and the quality of the executions and assets that are a result of this are a reality that you're going to have to face. It's happening today. I've done this myself. I've seen the results. I am completely convinced, which brings me here today to this company and talking to you now. So we've got... Very little time left, so let's wrap it up. Quant qual mixed methodologies make it possible to identify and measure the influences of the latent get deep grow behaviors. These are the behaviors that affect your business. With data science tools, 
There's no reason you can't measure the impact of these latent variables on the behavior and make them predictive. This allows you to develop the toolkits that encourage your team to develop innovation and campaign assets around actual experiences that drive behavior change. And if you don't do this, that's, I understand how it is. I can't get my company to change its stage gate policy. I can't do this or that, but we're at a point where if we want to stay relevant and if we want our brands to stay relevant, it's time to start thinking about that um, more constructively because if you don't, I promise you someone else will. So with that, I've got five minutes. Abel, I'm, I know that you're, you're in there somewhere. So I wanted to uh, help you or have me help us open this up to questions. Oh, wow. One question, Will, for you there uh, that kind of people have asked is, so obviously we launched Suzy Live today, which is our first IDI tool. So how does that really fit into this whole entire model and kind of what you've talked a little, little bit about today? So the way that fits into the model is that you can now actually ask someone about why they answered an actual question. It's an observation. Remember, you don't ask anything about something that you haven't observed. If you have an experience, an attribute, or some sort of association that you can ask at a quantitative scale, it's about being able to go and get the why right away. And when you have this type of framework, the feedback loop becomes that much more powerful because the feedback is based on experiences that drive behavior change. So being able to quickly launch, for example, a, a concept screen where if you have attributes that you know are drivers and being able to test against those rather than just stated purchase intents and pull a, a sample of people who liked and didn't like against those attributes and find out what it is about that experience that's driving those perceptions, you're now better enabled to actually iterate and evolve it so that's much more effective at driving that behavior change. By asking quantitatively about attributes that are predictive of behavior change, you can then qualitatively ask based on how someone agreed or disagreed to that asset and really, really, you know, hone in and tune your assets or your concepts um, to really win in market. Awesome. Kind so of I a, a, a simple, you know, how do you get to the model? Well, send us an email. We'll talk to you about that. Like today's about the, the quant call mix, mix methodologies. Next quarter, I, I promise you we'll have a very similar presentation about the other end of this. Awesome. Yep, definitely. Um, well, I know we, uh, one question here for you is, can you give a tangible example aside from the pool exercise? Yes. So the, one of the last brands I worked on, um, you can look me up on LinkedIn, was in the heartburn category, right? That was very flat. Um, by deploying this approach, by intercepting, our goal was household penetration um, and asking you know, consumers as they entered into the category, uh, questions about that, those latent variables, about how they felt at the time, um, you know, how they perceived the products and what touch points were relevant to them. We were able to shift our campaign to the point where we added over 4 million households in under 18 months. Um, wow. it, that's a, a, a small niche category, which was used as a, as a proof case, but that was about, it was over 70% of the total category growth at that time, right? So we, I promise you, we didn't create more heartburn. Um, what we did is we created the right message at the right time to facilitate the behavior change. I can give more examples of that, um, you know, um, that, that brands are doing this today. It's, it's a very, very powerful and effective tool, which is why I want to bring your attention to it. One final question for you, Will, is uh, can you share again how you arrive at the jobs to be done? Yeah. So when, when you actually do attribution models and you include touch points and sources of influence, you can find out what the, what the correlations are. So what messages are relevant to which consumers at that time and through which channels? So when you actually go and develop assets and you go to your qual, quant, iterative cycle, you start to ask the consumers questions about those attributes. So does this suggest it's a premium brand? It's for someone like me that it will do X, Y, Z. And you start to ask why or why not it doesn't do that effectively. And that becomes your quant qual feedback uh, mechanism that's now predictive, right? You're, you're optimizing it around an experience that you know is predictive. Definitely. And I just, I have to ask this one final question, but Will, you mentioned that you joined Suzy so that you could bring to life uh, research solutions that you always wished you had. Um, kind of what are you the most excited about in terms of the Suzy product and how does that answer some of the, uh, you know, questions and, and things that were kind of unanswered uh, when you were at your previous uh, roles? Yeah, so being able to target and retarget the way that Suzy can was game changing when I was using this on the client side. And knowing the tools that are available today, whether it's through Suzy or somewhere else where I know what that attribution is, the ability for me to quickly iterate and evolve um, and even get around stage gates, which I particularly enjoy, um, was game changing for me. It changed the way I saw this tool because I know what's coming, right? Like, like today, we're talking about the ability to actually talk to someone about an actual answer they made online in the moment, right? I used to do that as a vendor, you know, and I have to carry around a suitcase with like remote controls and like the, the speed at which you can do that and the cost efficiency at which you can do that and incorporate 
you know, predictive metrics is going to be game changing. And I, I'm just so excited to be part of shaping that future. Because if market research is going to stay relevant, it needs to stay relevant in a world of data science where more and more observable behaviors are going to be relevant. And we need to translate that into tools for market researchers to make better brand experiences. And I think this is a place to be to do that right now. Amazing. Well, you've already had a transformational impact on our business um, <laughs> and you will continue to have a transformational impact on our customer's business. So thank you for setting such a high bar uh, for what quality market research looks like here at Suzy and um, at scale. So thanks so much.